Welcome, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to the 12th John R. Evans Lectureship in Global Health. I'm Erica D. Ruggiero, and I'm at the Dalalana School of Public Health, and I'm a director of the Office of Global Public Health Education and Training. And I'm very delighted to welcome you to this lecture that recognizes the role that Dr. John Evans played at the University of Toronto and his global contributions to human health and well-being worldwide. But before we start, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We're also very delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Cesar Vitora from the Federal University of Pilatus, who will shortly talk to us about how to think locally, act globally. My Portuguese is not so good. <laughs> I can say obrigada, so. <laughs> um, and how your research has, carry, has been carried out in Pilatus, um, Brazil, and how it's contributed to equitable global policies. This lecture is the second half of the 2017 Gardner Global Health Symposium, and I'd like to recognize our partners and co-hosts for today's event, the Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health and the Gardner Foundation. And we've got representatives from both of those organizations here today. And so Dr. Stanley Slotkin, who's here, um, and he's the chief of Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health, and Dr. Janet Rossent, who's the president and scientific director and Dr. John Dirks, uh, Emeritus President and Scientific Director, both with the Gardner Foundation. So thanks everyone for attending the talk today and special thanks to those of you who are joining from the morning session. I've been assured that the content is distinct <laughs> and I'm sure your questions will be as well. So just a few housekeeping items for those of you who are tweeting today. Um, who's tweeting today? Prabhat, I can count on you, right? Um, the hashtag is hashtag Global Health 17, and also please note that this lecture will be filmed and will be available in its entirety on the uh, School of Public Health website following the event. So before we welcome our keynote speaker, I'd really like to tell you a bit about why this event is called the John R. Evans Lectureship um, in Global Health. Um, I think as some of you know, the Evans Lecture hosts and celebrates lively discussions on critical global health topics focusing on challenges countries face to improve the health of populations. And it also recognizes the University of Toronto's unique role in contributing to knowledge that can make a difference locally and globally. And Dr. Evans served as president of our university here from 1972 to 78, and he was also the co-founder of the Mars Discovery District. He was deeply engaged in medical education, academic administration, government service, charitable foundations and business, and he spent a lifetime really serving, and his talent, um, I think, has touched many people. I was among the many fortunate people who had the honor to meet Dr. Evans, um, a true collaborator with a breadth of experience and impact. Today's keynote speaker is a superb fit for our Evans lectureship in global health, and we're thrilled to host you um, at the University of Toronto. When I me mentioned to Tim Evans, John's son, who are, who's our keynote um, speaker was this year, Tim asked me to extend his very best wishes to, and I quote, his dear friend and colleague Cesar. And he said, and he wanted me to convey that his father would have been delighted and humbled to know that you're giving the Evans Lecture uh, this year. So right now, I'd like to now call upon France Gagnon, who's the Associate Dean of Research at the Dalana School of Public Health, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Erika. Uh, I am delighted, uh, Professor Victoria, to welcome you to the University of Toronto. Is it better? Um, Dr. Uh, Victoria is a child health, child health and nutrition uh, powerhouse whose research has uh, driven global policies uh, worldwide. And as a result, uh, the impact of his work uh, was uh, fundamental on uh, many children and many families worldwide. Uh, Dr. Victoria is a professor emeritus from the Federal University of Pelotas in Brazil. And I will say my Portuguese is worse than uh, Erika's Portuguese. 
Uh, he is also the recipient of the 2015 John Dix Canada, Canada uh, Gain, Gainer Global Health Award and currently leads the International Center for Equity in Health uh, in Brazil. Dr. Victoria received his medical degree uh, at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sol and uh, a PhD in epidemiology from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he is a principal investigator of one of the longest running bird court studies in the world, the 1982 Pilatas Bird Court, which continues to follow more than 6,000 people today. Uh, those of us who are working in epidemiology know uh, how amazing this achievement is too. His studies help establish the influence of the first thousand days uh, from conception until the uh, two, each, two years of age uh, on lifelong outcomes, including chronic diseases and human capital. Uh, perhaps one of uh, Professor Victoria's greatest contribution to public health uh, was his work in the 1980s uh, with, with uh, the first study showing the importance of exclusive breastfeeding in preventing uh, um, infant mortality. So his finding contributed to global policy recommendation, recommendations by UNICEF and WHO for mothers to breastfeed their infant exclusively for the first six months of their life. And more recently, uh, his uh, long-term bird court documented the benefit of breastfeeding on adult intelligence and uh, education and income. Finally, uh, many other contributions in the study of social inequities in child health, and all these uh, were impressive and absolutely critical to uh, human health. So joining, join me in welcoming uh, Professor uh, Victoria. Thank you very much. Thank for the kind words of introduction. Uh, real pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit uh, about the work we have been doing in this uh, remote part of the world, which is Pelotas, uh, since the 1980s. And we all know the environmental um, slogan, think globally and act locally. So think about climate change, uh, global pollution and do something in your own community to improve uh, the global situation. I'm going to switch this around later because I want to show you how you can think about local problems and local issues and end up influencing uh, global policy. Uh, Pelotas is a beautiful city in uh, southern Brazil, 340,000 inhabitants. It was very rich in the 19th century, so we had all these rich uh, neoclassical buildings. We have a beach. It's not an ocean beach, but it's a lake beach, which is almost as good. And we have a very diverse population. We have rich areas. We have poor areas. We have middle class areas. Brazil, unfortunately, has been ranked as one of the most unequal countries in the world in terms of socioeconomic uh, conditions and income distribution. We we got a little better for some 15 years or so. Things seem to be getting worse again now. But in any case, we do have this huge diversity of environmental living and living conditions and, uh, and uh, diets and uh, health in within uh, a single city. Uh, I trained in medicine in the 70s in, in Porto Alegre, which is my state capital. And I then went to work into community medicine. I went uh, straight into working in the slums, originally in Porto Alegre, and then in Pelotas, too. And these are the kind of kids that I saw. You know, I also worked a bit in hospitals. But I, I thought, I saw kids who were coming back all the time uh, for their health checkups and for illnesses, and they were not getting any better. They just had diarrhea after diarrhea episode. Or they had pneumonia, they had measles, they were undernourished. And the kid in the center here had marasmus, which is a severe form of undernutrition. And that's when it's, I had a click and said, I gotta do something about prevention. Uh, you know, it's not where I'm just fixing uh, these kids or improving their health for a limited period of time with medicines and and other medical interventions, but I'm not addressing uh, what's making them ill. And that's when I became interested in epidemiology. 
Then I stopped uh, practicing as a clinician and went to train uh, at the London School of Hygiene. It was a great training, I learned a lot. And I also became very interested in breastfeeding at that stage. And I'll tell you more about that later. Now, I've divided this talk into four components, more or less uh, on a chronological order. In the first, it, it was my work on exclusive breastfeeding. And I was always very impressed uh, that when I started uh, working in Brazil, the average duration of any breastfeeding was only two and a half months. Really short, you know, and I'm not talking about exclusive breastfeeding. It was just any breastfeeding had an average duration of only two and a half months. And I decided to say, you know, we have to do something about it. And I, we also have to do something about these children who are, have diarrhea and malnutrition, pneumonia and measles. And that's when I, I designed this case control study on breastfeeding and infant mortality. Uh, and in the uh, 70s and 80s, case control studies were the state of the art. You know, they, they have a bit of a bad reputation now, which is not fair. I mean, a good case control study can tell you an awful lot. And I, mean, I think this is a good one, by the way. <laughs> anyway, uh, we designed a study specifically to look at breastfeeding. And we said we have to quantify uh, the benefits of breastfeeding regarding mortality. So we took kids who died, and for each kid who died, we took two neighborhood controls uh, who were alive and this, uh, had the same age. And by matching by neighborhood, we ensured that the environmental conditions, the socioeconomic conditions would be very similar. And then we used another state-of-the-art technique, logistic regression, which was just coming out, had never been used for uh, diseases in developing countries. It was all for cancer and, and for cardiovascular disease. And so I did this case control study. And this was my first Lancet paper. You know, I still remember when I got the letter. There was no email those days. You didn't get your paper rejected in a week, you know. <laughs> it took three months for the letter to, for paper to go in three copies to London and then to come back. And one thing I learned, if you got an envelope, that was good news. If you got a, a, a small envelope, because that would say, yeah, we're happy to take your paper here, revision. If you got a big envelope, that was really bad news because they're returning your three copies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this one was a letter, you know, and I was really happy about that. And, and, but when I, uh, you know, as, as you all know, I mean, we, we look at odds ratios or relative risks in, 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 in case control studies. We adjusted for several confounding factors with logistic regression. And, I have, and we had three categories. You got breast milk only, you got breast plus formula or cow's milk that mixed milk feeding, or you get just formula or cow's milk. And when I sh first did this calculation, I thought I had made a mistake. You know, I had never seen a, an odds ratio of 14.2. And I said, I must have made a mistake. It must be 1.42. And then I did everything again in the computer. And no, that's true. That was the relative risk for dying of, uh, from diarrhea. And we uh, also found uh, a relative risk for about four for pneumonia. And we found a relative risk around two point something for other infections. So very, very substantial protection by breastfeeding, you know, adjusting for a number of confounding variables. But um, we already knew that breastfeeding was good. There were good studies done in, well, good, as, 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 as good as they could be. In the early 1900s in England, in the US, in Canada, showing that uh, absence of breastfeeding, and usually the kids were fed condensed milk at that stage. That was a, the typical, they'd, the parents would buy condensed milk and dilute it and give it to the kid. So there were some old studies, but they didn't know anything about confounding or selection bias and so on. So this one was the first modern study to really document the effect of breastfeeding. But what really caught my attention, and then we published a second paper in the AJE, was that a lot of kids, actually virtually all kids, were getting these tiny baby bottles with 50 ml uh, capacity with water or teas. My kids got it. My kids were born in the 80s. So as soon as they were born, you know, within the first week of life, they started getting water or teas. 
That's because people thought, you know, they need more water. Breast milk is not enough to supply their water requirements. So I decided to look at that. But in a way, it was like uh, looking at smoking and lung cancer in a population where everybody smoked because everybody was getting that. So I said, I'm going to do a dual dose response uh, analysis. And that's what I did. So if you had one, uh, then I did a regression, you know, a, a, a regression analysis, adjusting for all these confounders, and including adjusting for breastfeeding or formula feeding. And if you got one bottle a day, you had a 42% increase in risk compared of death due to diarrhea than if you had none. Even though there was virtually nobody who got none, but it's a regression model. If you had two bottles a day, your risk was 100% higher. If you had three, it was 186% higher. And so this was the first study that showed that giving anything in addition to breast milk really increases your risk of death. It was replicated soon enough, which was great, because uh, the, the Cebu cohort in Philippines uh, reproduced the results for morbidity. They didn't look at mortality. Mine was the only mortality study. And then uh, Bob Black, Ken Brown, and, and colleagues did that in, in Peru and also replicated that. And at the same time, there was research showing that you don't, a, a breastfed baby does not need any extra fluid. And in fact, because of the size of the stomach of a breastfed baby is so small, giving, putting anything in there will displace breast milk, will reduce breast milk intake and shorten the duration of breastfeeding in addition to uh, increasing the risk of infection. And I was really happy that this result, you know, very quickly, I mean, the, the, my, my work came out in 87, the Peruvian and uh, Philippine studies came out in 89, 90, and by 91, WHO and UNICEF started recommending exclusive breastfeeding. So that was a change in global policy. Most countries in the world now recommend exclusive breastfeeding for six months uh, as the ideal uh, m way of, uh, of feeding young babies. So uh, I think as a researcher, nothing gave, gives me greater pleasure than seeing policy change. You know? the, the Lancet paper was great, but this was much better. Okay, so let's talk about the second phase. At this stage, uh, I, uh, we started worried about how the growth of, bre of babies, breast or bottle fed, was being evaluated in the world. And we, I was part of the committee that published this book entitled Physical Status, the Use and Interpretation of Anthropometry. And uh, we, one of the things that struck us, we were looking at growth curves, is that the, the, most of the, the WHO recommended the NCHS growth curves, the National Child Health Study from the US, which was also adopted in Canada, by the way. It was all based on, the, on a single community uh, in, of Fells in Iowa, where they had a, a cohort study with a, couple, with a few hundred children. It wasn't, it wasn't a very large study. But they, they, more than 80% of the kids in, this, in their growth curves were formula fed. And if you take a growth curve and if you make it flat so that the median child would grow along the zero line and, the, and you express differences in terms of z-scores, what we found uh, See if I can try the light. Yeah. What we found is that perfectly healthy breastfed babies from well off families with good health conditions, they were above the curve and then they seemed to falter. So, what happened when you were plotting a baby on a curve and it's faltering? Well, breast milk is not enough. This, kid, this baby needs supplementary food, it needs formula. So, and we challenged this idea, we said maybe the curve is wrong. And maybe the curve, breastfed babies are, seem to be faltering because the curve itself is getting fat. They are not putting on so much weight as the babies uh, based on, upon whom the curve was built. And at that stage, we planned a multi-center growth reference standard. Uh, Kay Dewey was here this morning, she was one of my uh, partners in this study, uh, and we selected six countries, which are here, 
Uh, we did it in Oslo, in Davis, California, and Pelotas. We did it in Ghana, M uh, Oman, and New Delhi. And in each of these, we selected uh, families where uh, conditions for achieving optimal growth were all present. So there were high socioeconomic families. Uh, they had healthy non-smoking mothers. Babies were singleton, born a term. They had good health care and everything. So, so in Pelotas, we had to screen a couple thousand people to come up with 300 who had these conditions. But we only wanted the best. We say we only want kids uh, who will grow optimally and whose mothers are willing to breastfeed according to the recommendations of six months exclusive breastfeeding plus continued breastfeeding. So we selected the sample. There was an ideal, an optimal sample. So we call this a prescriptive standard. We're prescribing that this is how uh, growth should take place. Now, the question that I always get is, what about genetic differences? Well, to our surprise, we found that up to the age of six uh, or five years, which was the, the, the limit of the study, uh, children from these six very different places in the world had very, very similar growth. And I was uh, saying earlier, in fact, the children from Pelotas at two years of age were slightly taller than Nor Norwegian children, which you would never think if you compare me to a Norwegian guy. You know? <laughs> but I, I was underfed, probably. Uh, anyway, we had very, very similar uh, growth patterns up to five years of age. And we, 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 were, we developed the protocol in Pelotas. We trained the people from the different countries who came and to we did the pilot study. The first child who completed the study was Luisa here from, uh, from Pelotas as well. And it was adopted by the, the World Health Organization you know, after a lot of statistical uh, smoothing of the curves and pooling of all the different sites because the growth was similar in the six sites. And now it's used in over 140 countries. So if you go to a clinic here in Toronto, if you take a baby to a clinic, they'll be uh, judged based on this curve. So next, third out of four uh, errors. The third is, uh, which is my work on birth cohorts. And uh, in, I have, I'm lucky to have a colleague called uh, Professor Fernando Bajos, who has been my uh, intellectual partner for many years. And in 1982, we started the first birth cohort. We were worried that uh, uh, most of the births in the world, the vast majority of births take place in developing countries. And yet all the birth cohort studies are from Scandinavia and England and US and Canada. So we wanted to see, to develop uh, birth cohort studies in, in in low and middle income countries as well. We still follow up 68% of the cohort after 30 years. In every 11 years we have a, started a new cohort and these are follow up rates at, in, the most recent f in the most recent visit to the cohorts. Uh, it's been a lot of work. Uh, when we started, uh, this is me, lots of hair and big beard. Uh, this is Fernando taking turns in our only computer. was the first ever computer in Pelotas. You know, Pelotas is pretty, pretty isolated. We're four hours from the nearest local airport. So we, we were the first group to, to have a computer there in the university. Uh, our questionnaires were printed in paper. These are our interviewers. We also helped do the interviews and measuring kits, you know, weighing kits with the portable scales at home. All the visits took place at home at that stage. And uh, we had this advantage of st studying all births in the city. There were 6,000 births. So that included from the rich families, upper middle class with comfortable homes, to middle class families, and to very poor families living in slums. So we had the total spectrum in the city. But uh, we started our cohort looking at undernutrition, uh, diarrhea, infant mortality, and Brazil changed. I mean, the world changed. 
And so now we continue with our cohorts with the prevailing issues that we, uh, prevailing health problems that we're analyzing now include uh, body composition, this is a bod pod, a DEXA, here's a 3D photonic scanner. This is a great piece of equipment, I don't know if you've seen one. Basically, our cohort uh, members put on some tight uh, uh, lycra clothes that we provide them, and they go inside a, 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 a black chamber, and there's light going around, and there are several cameras, and we take a 3D picture of them. So we don't do anthropometry anymore. We get all the circumference, abdominal circumference, hip circumference, arm circumference, you know, leg length, whatever, just by computer. So it's a great, a great piece. And we have uh, genetics now. We have lots of uh, biomarkers. We have GWAS in the whole cohort. We have a big lab and so on. But what I want to talk to you about is, you know, what, what our uh, research from our cohorts managed to, to help uh, understand better uh, early nutrition. And this is not based on the cohorts, but this was one interest that I had for a long time. We published one paper in pediatrics in 2001 using the old NCHS curve, and then we updated this paper in 2010 using the new WHO curve that came out in 2006. And again, this is a flattened growth chart, and you look at the ages, kids, these are kids from 54 DHS surveys in low and middle income countries, the average of all surveys. They start, they are born a little bit below the zero line or below the ideal birth weight, and they falter in the first two years of life. And I'm sure you all know the concept of a thousand days, it's just adding the duration of gestation to two times 365. And this graph became widely reproduced because it also highlighted that if you want to do something about nutrition, you better act soon. After two years, kids tend to grow in weight and in height uh, parallel to the standard, to the norm. They really faltered. They did not grow appropriately up, up to age two. And that's when we came up with this idea, the Lancet. Uh, proposed a series on undernutrition, and they invited me to lead a paper on the long-term consequences of undernutrition. And, and we came up with a, with a consortium by selecting the five cohorts in the world that had similar data uh, out, outside of the developed world. So low and middle income countries, there are five cohorts that had 20 years follow-up, and they're population-based and so on, and these were Brazil, Guatemala, South Africa, India, and Philippines. And we came up with this name, a Consortium of Health Orientated Research in Transitioning Societies. And we spent our first meeting deciding on the acronym and got one. <laughs> and then we started to do science. So you, need, you need a good name if you want it to catch. You know? uh, and we did lots of publications. We looked at blood pressure, uh, diabetes, glucose. We also looked at height. We looked at, uh, at uh, body composition. And I'm gonna make a long story very, very short and very simple. And uh, you know, one, one point I like to make is that if you want to influence policy, you have to be able to do rigorous simplification. I mean, you don't need a 95 confidence interval in every data point. You don't even need the data point there in every point. You have to convey a message that is based on science. And uh, we looked, and, and let me just tell you why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because we started getting all these papers from cohorts from high income countries saying, putting on weight in early life is bad for you. You can't, you know, it causes uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, obesity in adults. So can we do, uh, you know, we, and I said, this is not true. I mean, the, the, those cohorts in Finland are born with 3.6 kilos. You know, our kids are born with three kilos, or in India, they're born with 2.8 or 2.9 kilos. So what, what do we find in our cohorts? And we found two very s interesting things. The first thing is, if you put on, and this is age, and this is a really complicated type of analysis called conditional a growth analysis. Yeah, some of you may be familiar with it. It would take me two, two, two hours to explain, 
But if, if you go to our papers, it's all explained in there. But basically, you adjust for the fact that weights and heights are correlated with one another, and they're correlated over time in the same kit. But you get the basic messages. What is, the, what is good and what is bad about putting on weight at different ages? And for survival, if you have a high birth weight, or if you put weight rapidly in the first year of life, you're less likely to die. That's very clear. There are lots of studies about that. And also for human capital, such as uh, intelligence, for adult height, ability to have healthy children in the next generation. We had all this information from the cohorts. You know, these are huge cohorts. It's also good uh, to put on weight early in life. But if you put on weight around three years or later, it doesn't do any good. I mean, your brain is ready. You know, your brain is almost ready by the age of two. You know, there's, there's some scope for growth, but 70 or 80% of it is, is uh, of growth of, of brain size is achieved in the first two years of life. Uh, you, you develop the number of uh, kidney cells or nephrons. You develop the number of beta cells in your pancreas, the number of uh, liver cells, and so on. So your whole capacity to handle, for example, a westernized diet, which is very rich in calories and salt and so on, it is built in the first few years. So if you're still building that, you're fine, but after that it doesn't help that much. Now, talking about non-communicable diseases, this is our finding from the cohorts. If you put away rapidly from birth in the first year, you actually have a slight protection against long-term disease because you're actually building your, your organs, your viscera. But if you put away rapidly after two years, your risk goes up very, very quickly. And this is what we have. So this is a simplified cartoon. It's an oversimplification. But in a nutshell, this is what we found in the cohort. There is a, a, a need to promote uh, weight gain uh, rapidly. And then after a certain age, you have to worry about obesity. We went further. And we did this paper in The Lancet in which we, we disentangled uh, linear growth from uh, weight gain that is not needed for linear growth. For example, if you have longer bones or more muscle or bigger brain, you weigh more, but there is excess weight gain that goes beyond what is necessary for linear growth. And the message here we found, a more refined message, was that if you, the rapid weight gain after two four to four years of life, but not before, increases the risk of non-communicable diseases. The second message is linear growth did not show any bad effects on chronic disease. You could be taller, and if you're still lean, you don't have higher risk of, uh, of uh, NCDs. And linear growth in the first two years improves human capital. That means you, you are more intelligent, you, you're able to work better, and so on. The challenge thus becomes we need to prevent uh, growth faltering early in life. But after that, we have to prevent rapid weight gain. And this is a complicated public health message because depending on your age, you need different approaches and even different goals. So I'm not sure that has been fully translated into policy yet. Uh, I hope that it will because it's a, it's a major it is a major important not to restrict the growth of young children, but at the, also, uh, at the same time being concerned about uh, rapid weight gain later in life. This is the cohorts collaboration, a whole bunch of people doing cohorts, very nice group to work with. Now, uh, before I move on to the last part, I just want to show you a couple results on breastfeeding, which is, as you know, it's sort of my mo first motivation into uh, research, and now we're able in the cohorts to look at breastfeeding and uh, achievements uh, many, many years later down the line. So we looked in this paper at breastfeeding and uh, intelligence at 30 years of age. We had IQ tests for 3,800 of our cohort members at the age of 30, and this is what we found. Oh, the, just let me start by saying something that's really important. There's no clear, there was no clear patterning, social patterning of breastfeeding in Pelotas in the 80s. Uh, rich and poor breastfed uh, alike for short periods, but we didn't have the situation that you 
often find in US or Canada or Europe where the well-educated, richer mothers breastfeed for longer. We didn't have that. So we had a, a unique opportunity to look at the effect of breastfeeding without this heavy confounding and selection bias by socioeconomic position. So we found this is short breastfeeding going on to long breastfeeding, a four point difference in IQ, a one year difference in schooling, which is quite important because schooling in Pelotas is very short, like eight to nine years in that cohort. So one year could make a difference. And this interesting pattern for income, it's actually, if you fit a linear trend here, it fits perfectly and there's no evidence of a departure from linearity, but they actually made more money. And they made about four to 500 reais a month more, which in, Bra in Brazil is about 20% of a, of a salary, of average salary. Uh, we always get the question of, who, uh, you know, what's happening here? Because this group seems to go down in terms of income. It's still much better than the other three. But the, 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 the joke we have is the following. Uh, these people who are high IQ, high schooling, and don't make much money must be academics. <laughs> it's the best explanation for, for why, you know, there's a thick line there. But anyway, this paper got a lot of press, you know, got c CNN and... Um, BBC and New York Times, because it really, uh, they, they are two issues that there's a lot of controversy about, you know, breastfeeding, mainly in, in, in wealthy countries. There's all this issue about, is, uh, should women be, quote unquote, forced to breastfeed or promoted to breastfeed and maybe made guilty by not breastfeeding. Uh, we address this in the paper because we think breastfeeding is really a social responsibility. And when we published the Lancet series on breastfeeding, uh, last year, uh, are the cover of the cities was saying that success in breastfeeding is not the sole responsibility of a woman. The promotion of breastfeeding is a collective societal responsibility. I mean, the society must provide uh, sufficient pregnancy leave, workplace protection, control of advertising of formula, and a whole set of measures that promote breastfeeding. So uh, this is uh, my breastfeeding research at turning into, uh, you know, 30 years later. <laughs> I'm happy to say, you know, we all off, you, we will hear lots of bad things about Brazil recently in, in the media, but I'm, I'm, I can assure that uh, the politicians, uh, our politicians are way behind. They were not breastfed, probably. They, <laughs> but Brazil has done some really good things in the last 20 years. Brazil had made a lot of progress in many uh, areas related to health promotion protection. We have a national health service. And for me, uh, this is the most striking example. Look at breastfeeding duration average in the whole country in 75, two and a half months, 2007, 14 months. This is the, ma the major change in breastfeeding anywhere in the world. Uh, there's no country that has managed to reverse this to such an extent. And I won't spend time on, on everything that happens, but it was actions at multiple level, intersectorial actions, not only health, but uh, employment, labor, rights, and so on. Now, last uh, chapter, I uh, hope I'm okay with time. Uh, uh, I have been, uh, now that I'm nearing the end of my career, uh, I still hope I have a few years to go. Uh, but I th I've been more and more concerned about uh, simplifying things and translating science to policy and to the other passion in my career, which is the study of inequalities. And I'll show you why, because I think this is really important. Uh, we published a series in the Lancet in 2003 called the Child Survival Series. Uh, a bunch of uh, scientists and policymakers were worried about the fact that we still had 10.8 million deaths of children a year uh, as of 2000 in the world. And we proposed a mechanism with a series of meetings and report to take stack, stock of progress in preventing child deaths and to hold countries and partners accountable. It's an accountability mechanism, and this is how the countdown to 2015 was born. Uh, why 2015? Because the Millennium Development Goals set up in 2000, 
had a deadline in, in of uh, 2015 for achieving a two-thirds reduction in uh, health of under five children, in mortality of under five children, sorry. And we produced seven reports. Each one of this has been a huge amount of work. And it's a multi-stakeholder initiative. We managed to involve WHO, UNICEF, the Lancet, the several bilaterals. And this is the core, the heart of the countdown. The heart of the countdown is a two-page spread for each uh, high mortality country, summarizing everything we know on mortality, on nutrition, on policies, on services, on programs, on intervention coverage, showing time trends whenever possible. So uh, a policy very widely tested with policymakers to make sure that they understood. You know, some of our graphs, this bit here, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that, is the equity graph. We had four or five versions before we arrived at one that people could understand. And so um, when we did this series, uh, we had one paper which was on equity, was that entitled Applied an Equity Lens to Child Health and Mortality, more of the same is not enough. The problem is that the MDG said a country X must reduce mortality by two thirds. And there was nothing about disparities. It didn't matter if the indigenous populations remained or if the Afro descendants in Brazil remained with high mortality or if the poor or rural inhabitants didn't make progress. As long as the country had a two thirds reduction, tick, you know, success. And we thought that was not enough. So uh, in that quest, we started to analyze surveys from different parts of, of the world, the available surveys. And we developed this graph which we call the equiplot. So let's look at Nigeria and Malawi. The equiplot is very simple. Here's contraception, antenatal care, birth attendance care, uh, breastfeeding, vaccines, treatment of diarrhea, and so on. Here, zero to 100% coverage. This uh, light brown uh, circle is the richest 20% in the country, and this is the poorest 20%. So this very simple graph, we had to analyze hundreds of surveys to do that. But if you just look at that, you see that Nigeria, skilled attendant at delivery, is present only in 5% of deliveries of the poor and in 90% of the rich. Malawi is much more equitable. So Nigeria and Malawi require different solutions. And that's why we're trying to incorporate equity considerations into the, uh, the, the, the global thinking. I've been interested in equity for a long time. I wrote this book in 88 because Brazil was then the most inequitable country in the world, as I have said. And I, 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 it's very important for me to convey the idea that concern about equity is very important on moral grounds for ethical reasons, for human rights reasons. But it's also very important for practical grounds because you can have better programs if you understand the inequalities in access to the different interventions that are available. And this is our equiplot. You know, again, I'm trying to convince myself that Brazil is still uh, salvageable. You know, we're having a hard time with a lot of things. But look at these inequalities in stunting in Brazil. This is slightly different because we have the five wealth quintiles of children here, and the poorest had 60% stunting in 74, five when the richest had. 12%, and now this, look at this massive reduction over time due to social policies, to uh, redistribution of wealth, to redeployment of services in the poorest areas of the country. So again, this is a, a, a good success story, which is based also on, on good data. The countdown is now uh, being uh, renamed. Uh, the MDGs finished in 2015, and now we're tackling the difficult challenge of monitoring the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, uh, up to 2030. And the last SDG is very close to what I think should be done. The last SDG, number 17, says that we have to increase the availability of high quality, timely, and reliable data disaggregated by income, gender, age, race, ethnicity, and so on. So that the whole uh, heart of the disaggregated analysis. We have changed the countdown. I'm happy to be continue 
as one of its uh, coordinators. Uh, this is a young team in Pelotas. Uh, they, they are our number crunchers. We acquired uh, representative uh, probability surveys from all over the world. Uh, we have now over 350 surveys from 110 countries in our database. And we analyze them uh, with, the, with the special lens on documenting inequalities. Uh, WHO learned about our work, and now if you go to the WHO website, there is a global health observatory, and the health equity monitor is all uh, populated by the work of these kids who work with us now. Uh, so all the data are provided by our group. Uh, well, to wrap up, you know, we started uh, thinking globally and acting locally. Uh, I tried to do the, uh, the reverse. I started looking at the kids I was seeing in my clinic, thinking about their problems and switching around and putting Pelotas at the top of the world. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for your, that most inspiring talk, and um, I think many takeaways, including the importance of perseverance uh, over many eras. So thank you for telling us your story about how data influence policy, but there's much more work to be done. So I'd like to invite our panelists to come up to um, the front. So this is um, the second part of this um, lectureship involves three panelists, um, Dr. Diego Bassani, Nandita Perumal and Anne Emanuel Berm. And we, we picked these three people very carefully. Um, and many of them have been touched by the work that uh, Dr. Vittora has shared with us. And so we're going to be inviting them to provide some reflections. So just a few words about each of them first. Um, Dr. Diego Bassani is an assistant professor of epidemiology at the School of Public Health here, and also a scientist at SickKids. And he also studied at the Federal University of Pilatus and uh, in Brazil and works very closely with D Dr. Vitora, our sources tell us, um, on his birth cohort study. The second panelist is Nandita Perumal. I think it's important to hear from the upcoming generation and uh, Nandita is a PhD candidate in the epidemiology stream at the Dalana School of Public Health and also a doctoral trainee at the Center for Global um, Child Health. Thank you, Donald, for uh, suggesting her. Um, and she's studying child nutrition, growth and development in low and middle income countries and has done work in Kenya, India and Geneva. And Anne Emanuel Byrne, um, our third and final panelist, is a professor of social and behavioral health sciences and critical development studies at the Dalana School. And her work explores the history, politics, and political economy of global health, particularly in Latin America. And so we thought as a set that these three panelists would provide some very um, insightful contributions from each of their perspectives. So I've promised them that I'm not going to ask any wicked questions and questions that they haven't had a chance to reflect on, and I will stand by my word. And uh, Dr. Vittora will offer some reflections after he hears their responses. So starting with Diego and, and also Nandita, um, I've asked each of you to sort of think about how Dr. Vittora's work has influenced your own research. So first Diego and Nandita, then you can reflect on how his work has influenced your own research as a doctoral student in particular. Um, and then finally, uh, Anne Emanuel will comment on um, Dr. Vittora's interests and how they've intersected with her own work on the history of child health. So they'll each offer some remarks, then I'll have a next round of questions. Dr. Vittora will provide some comments, and then I'll open it up to the audience for your burning questions. So Diego, can you kick uh, things off for us? So thank, you, thank you for the invitation. And uh, th I think this is a, like, an easy response for me because I can, um, blame Cesar for anything that I do wrong, I think, in my life, because all the epi epidemiology I know I learned from him. Uh, I don't know if I was a good student, but he was an excellent professor. And uh, I think it shaped um, my career trajectory. Um, can you can you hear him? Because I, I yeah. don't think the microphone's working. Um, no? OK. Um, yes. OK. okay we good. have a green light, so. It has. Um, shaped my career in, in, in a way that, for me, at the time, was unexpected. I was, when I started doing my PhD in Pelotas, I was a dentist thinking I was going to learn epidemiology and apply to public health dentistry. 
uh, and here I am working in maternal and child health with global issues, doing program evaluation, which is something that Cesar also does um, and um, hasn't talked about in his talks, but that's a, another important uh, facet of, uh, of his trajectory. So um, there, there's a lot of, of Cesar in what I became as a, as a professional. Um, I also think that um, I've learned and I carry a lot of the lessons in terms of simplifying the message and trying to convey the results of your research uh, in a way that, that, that everyone can understand. Cesar used to say in, in class to us, you have to explain it, be able to explain it to your grandmother who is not a scientist. Uh, and so she, if she can understand that, what should go into, in, into your papers. So it's the simplification and the, 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 the ability to convey messages to policymakers in a way that they can understand and they can act on. As academics, I think we tend to get very entangled in the butts and, and all of the, the, the nuances of, of, of our findings when to move action, to, to promote action and to move policy forward. We need to be able to, to simplify um, what we do. So Cesar has influenced my research immensely um, from teaching me uh, during my, let's say, my, my, my two first years of life as an epidemiologist, uh, <laughs> so in, in, a, in a way uh, aligning with, the, with the, the, um, the first years of life of, of a child, I think it was determinant of uh, who I am now for the bad and for the good, <laughs> or for the good and for the bad. Um, and yeah, I only have like to thank Cesar and, and, and to um, be, I think, witness to... Um, to what he has achieved in his life and, and, and try to um, inspire myself and continue to inspire myself in his work. Okay. Nantita? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm excited to be here today because um, Dr. Victoria, your work has really influenced mine very directly actually because um, your role in the Pilates birth cohort studies has probably had the biggest impact because not only do I draw upon the 2004 Pilates birth cohort study for my dissertation research, but also the 1982 cohort study that you had led contributed to data for the WHO growth standards, which are at the crux of the dissertation research questions that I'm trying to address. So in those ways, it's really quite uh, been influential for me and also as an epidemiologist, much of your work in earlier years especially focused on the importance of methods. So I remember um, one of your most cited papers is actually a tutorial that um, lays out how to use conceptual fr frameworks in epidemiologic research and really trying to understand the roles that risk factors play at the individual um, community and household levels and sort of really being mindful of that when you're looking at epidemiological analysis. And that's something that I really found helpful when I was a master's student looking at um, quantifying risk or factors that affect knowledge, attitudes, and practices of pregnant women in Western Kenya. That's work that I did with Donald. Um, and also another theme that's common in your work in as an epidemiologist is really trying to measure and, and understand variability in a population health outcome. And really not just looking at average effects, but really looking at the distribution of health outcomes. And that's something that my dissertation parallels in, my, in the theme in that I look at heterogeneity or variability in the timing of birth, so gestational age, and how that influences measurement of child health, mm -hmm. nutrition status at the population level. So in those ways, I've been directly influenced, but I've also been indirectly influenced by your work in that um, it has really contributed to setting the research agenda and pushing it forward for child health research. So it's influenced me in that way, and it's influenced the research ag agenda of my mentors that I work with um, as well, one of whom is Diego. And <laughs> more, more importantly, it's also, I had the pleasure of visiting the Center for Epidemiologic Research, which is where we first met. And it was really 
an incredible experience because I saw how all this robust research environment where new epidemiologists were being trained and really doing in really incredible, interesting stuff. And I hope that these will be epidemiologists that will be my colleagues in the future. So both directly and indirectly it's had a profound in influence on me so far. Thank you. Anna Manuel. So it is just such a joy and honor for me to participate uh, on this mess, on this uh, joint table here. Uh, Cesar and I have uh, been in touch, have known one another for over 20 years. And we started out really in uh, one of his great uh, passions and principles, which is in the course of South-North learning. And uh, we worked together to mentor some young Brazilian health policy analysts to write about the origins of this national health system in Brazil in order to try at least to educate US audiences. This was in one of the perennial efforts to get the US to pass national health insurance legislation in the early 2000s. Um, and so through that uh, process, it was uh, very inspiring for me to see someone who had spent his entire career, notwithstanding offers from around the world, committed to his country. And committed to his country, not just uh, in the fact of being a, a low then middle income country, but through dictatorship, through debt crises, through structural adjustment, uh, through enormous uh, repression crises. And yes, there have been uh, moments in the last 10 or 15 years of uh, improvement, shall we say, and, and greater uh, equity and uh, ability to transcend uh, some of these issues. But I think it's inc it just remarkable that Cesar has devoted his career um, in, uh, to Pelotas, to, uh, to Brazil, and to South-North learning. Now, in particular, uh, Cesar and I share an interest in infant mortality and the determinants of infant mortality. My interest is more from the past, although we both have, and I work largely in Uruguay, uh, just a little bit south of Pelotas, and we actually share an interest in Uruguay. Uh, mine is more professional, yours more personal. I think your granddad was uh, <laughs> Uruguayan. And the folks uh, that I was studying, the public health analysts, epidemiologists, slash demographers, policy makers from the early 20th century, were very concerned about Uruguay's infant mortality rates, but from a slightly different perspective. They saw around 1900 that they had the best or lowest infant mortality rates in the world, except maybe for Norway, uh, but lower than England, lower than France, and so on. And then, unlike any other country in the world, those infant mortality rates stagnated. So they went from this place of uh, great advantage to one of increasing disadvantage. And so the pediatricians in Uruguay started to study what was going on, breastfeeding and lack of breastfeeding, the use of, uh, in this case, unpasteurized cow's milk being an enormous problem, uh, but also the peculiar development of Uruguay's welfare state, which paid more attention to older folks than younger folks, in part because there was this early advantage. Now, these, uh, these uh, public health uh, actors that I study had an advantage in terms of policy making over CESAR in that because it was such a small country, they were at one and the same time clinicians, uh, observers, uh, epidemiologists and demographers, running uh, institutions, and political elites. So when they wanted to make policy, they didn't have to go to someone else, right? <laughs> and so eventually, uh, what they uncovered was uh, the need for, uh, and again, based on observational, not on uh, rigorous statistical studies, but a need for a whole child approach to health, and really a child rights approach to health. And so Uruguay passed this 1935 Code of Children's Rights that called for the right to housing and education, uh, as well as uh, breast milk and, and, and so on. So very structural issues, uh, redistribution of income eventually in terms of uh, family wages and so on. 
and this subsequently influenced a Pan-American uh, Code of Children's Rights after the Second World War, and arguably uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, in more recent times in the early 90s. I just wanna end on a very personal note. Uh, just around the time uh, when I first uh, met uh, Cesar, at least virtually, I was having uh, my child, and I was in New York where I Can had speak six weeks, bit? sorry, six weeks mm -hmm. of Thank you. disability leave, not maternity leave, but I was absolutely uh, intent not only on uh, getting to six months of exclusive breastfeeding, but exceeding that. And so I ended up having to breastfeed in my course uh, one afternoon because I was back teaching. It happened to be a course on gender and public policy. And so I was able to weave Cesar's findings right into the course from a very <laughs> personal level. So thank you for that. Nice. <laughs> Cesar, would you like to comment on any of what you've heard so far? No, just a quick thank you to all three of you. I know Can you hear? Who have represent different kind of interactions. I mean, Diego was my student, so he had, he had to explain his uh, multivariable models to his grandmother, <laughs> <laughs> which was one thing I kept doing that. They would come up and present something. Okay, now, let's suppose I'm your grandmother. How would you explain that? And a brilliant student who is going, has already gone very far. Uh, Nandita only spent a short time with us, but did great work in sorting out gestational ages. You know, gestational ages, ascertainment, is a nightmare for epidemiologists because there are so many different methods, mm -hmm. and one method doesn't necessarily agree with the other. And worse still, if you measure it in 82, and you now measure it in 2015 or 2017, you want to have some uh, consistency even though now everybody has ultrasound and nobody had ultrasound in 82. So it's one of those things which struggle when we have these long-term studies, when we, the data we collected baseline were collected with a different standard than we have today. And so comparability and so on is affected, but and Andit is still working with us in great, great progress. Uh, and I didn't know about uh, helping your, uh, your breastfeeding, uh, your disability <laughs> leave. Um, I hope you're better. I, I hope you're healthy now. <laughs> Uh, but it's one of the issues that I, I really worried about is, is, is it breastfeeding, you know, it, uh, limitations to breastfeeding in public, uh, and, and some of the bad, the, the bad press we get with some of our papers on breastfeeding, in which there is a, there, there is a lot of um, a movement, and, and not only, in, and I'm not, again, I'm not blaming individuals here, but industry, uh, formula industry is strongly behind uh, parts of academia that uh, keep challenging uh, breastfeeding recommendations keep and, and submit uh, studies that show the advantages of breastfeeding to a, a standard of critique that is unheard of, you know. Things like uh, the, the Pelota study where we had no social patterning of breastfeeding, you know, no way. And then we have, even have genetic intelligence uh, markers now that show that uh, that the, the 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 family the kids who breastfeed had the same genetic potential. They they are really are more intelligent because they got breast milk. But even that is repeatedly challenged by saying, "Oh, this is bias and this is confounding and whatnot." Uh, so, uh, actually, breastfeeding is a is a great area for for these studies. And I'm happy you mentioned Uruguay. I don't know how many of you know Uruguay. It's a wonderful country. It's really a nice country, uh, three million inhabitants. Uh, I actually have a house there. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Uruguay. My grandpa was Uruguayan, and and they got a lot of things right. You know, their infant mortality is uh, very low. Uh, social protection, the child rights. I mean, that's a real example. They they pioneer child rights in the world. You know, some of the the north Euro northern European. You know that much better than I do. The northern European. Uh, legislation on child protection is inspired by Uruguay. Uh, so it's a, it's a remarkable country and I'm happy you remember that and thank you all three of you for your very kind comments.
So I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, but get your questions ready. Um, so Diego and Nandita and Anna Manuel, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so reflecting what, what you've heard, of course, you know, in research we always like to say more research is needed. And what are some of the evidence gaps that remain to be addressed to advance equitable neonatal and child health policy? So Diego, based on where you're at um, in your career, what do you think might be the case? And perhaps uh, Nandita, you can reflect on that question, but also from the perspective of a new investigator, um, Anna Manuel as well. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the most important things, which is something that I've heard from Cesar for a number of years, um, and what he mentioned in his last slide, is, is, is touching on exactly that important point of measurement and how to improve the quality of the data the timing of the data, so to make sure that we have data for decision making um, at the time that the data is needed for decision making, and that policymakers cannot have the use the the the, the age of a certain st statistic as an excuse to ignore it or not use it, and and how that can push accountability forward, not only at the country level but also at the donor level, and and I think that is an important point that we don't often reflect enough about the role of donor countries like, Can like Canada in influencing local policies and setting the direction of, of research and of programmatic agendas in, in the countries. I think that that's been um, very superficially perceived by all of us and I don't think we as academics have acted enough on this area of trying to influence also donor countries and work with the, the, the local governments to improve their ability to collect data, build capacity to collect data, and to collect good quality data in, time, in a timely manner, and to analyze the data and look at the results and use that to, for decision making. Mm -hmm. That's what we're missing, and I think that's, the, that's the, the, the big challenge ahead, is like how to improve it. We've been in, 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 in this um, so, sort of a, a long period of stagnation where we can't improve the speed at which we collect data and, and make data available. Even though we have computational progress, we don't have, we haven't seen that reflected in the, 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 the timing of, of data avail availability. Okay. And Tisha? Um, I, I don't think I have much more to add to that, or I, I certainly can't disagree. I think availability of data is important, and I think data where the we should have more efforts put in where we need the data. So in a point made this morning was that uh, often in settings where the problems are persistent and the most prominent is where we don't actually have data available for those settings. So I think having that discordance um, or investing more time in that discordance would be important. And I also think there's, um, there are certain issues in global health, and global health is unique in that way, that it's very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and requires a lot of collaborative research. And Cesar has shown that over the course of his career that much of the work is done in collaboration with many other colleagues from various settings. So I think just continuing down that path is also really important. Okay. And Emmanuel, and um, for those of you in the audience, if you could start getting ready for a few questions. And I would just underscore the importance of looking at equity in the context of the larger societal and structural determinants mm -hmm. of health. So when we look at particular interventions such as breastfeeding, uh, growth monitoring, and so on, uh, we also need to take into account, uh, it strikes me, into, and especially into the future, the slide that Cesar showed uh, with all of the policy interventions from uh, labor conditions to social policy to re redistributive income that have also influenced ultimately the outcomes but can be very, very difficult to measure because they aren't necessarily residing at the individual level. So I, I'm hoping that this kind of multivalent analysis will be the task of uh, the next generations. So thoughts or questions from the audience? Yes. Can you, um, we don't have a microphone, so can you use your basketball coach voice or we can bring this one.
Absolutely. Yeah. When you look at that slide, which of the factors do you think are the most important? And I guess the other question would be, do you think that we're off base in our emphasis globally on nutrition as a way forward to, to um, cure spending? In many countries, many organizations have spending as the primary objective. Absolutely. Sorry, <laughs> Comments? I, should I? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we, you know, in the, we, we're getting a new Lancet series every week these days. <laughs> But <laughs> it's an epidemic, actually. <laughs> our, child, our child survival <laughs> series in 2003 was the first ever. And we did some fancy modeling, and we say we can prevent two-thirds of under five child deaths in the world using existing off-the-shelf interventions, such as vaccines, antibiotics, uh, micronutrient supplementation, vitamin A, uh, good birth assistance and antenatal care. So we, we were pretty sure about that, two thirds. That was a good number and say, okay, we have 10.8 million deaths a year. If we only ever have these very simple off the shelf intervention, we can prevent seven million. Now, uh, in 2008, we did the same thing for nutrition. And as you said, very disappointing. The direct nutrition interventions, if you apply all that is known, it, they could prevent at most one third of the Deaths. And Zufi Bhutta is not here today. I know he's arriving tomorrow. Uh, he is the one who did those calculations as part of our group. In nutrition, is much more complicated than mortality. In mortality, there are lots of magic bullets that you can apply and, and get quick results. Nutrition is much more complicated. It depends on quality of food. Quality of food depends on affordability and on salaries and on wages and redistribution policies. Mm -hmm. and and I think we're still sort of scratching the surface in terms of understanding better how to prevent. We, we know success story. Brazil was a great one, as you saw. You know, We now have 7% uh, stunting in the most recent national survey. That was 10 years ago, because we haven't had that survey since then. I'm sure it's lower now. And the gap between rich and poor is like that, because there are lots of policies. Increase of the value of the minimum wage was very important. When I did my 1982 study, a minimum wage was $50 a month for a family. Uh, now it's $500 a month. Uh, uh, conditional cash transfers, you know, very effective. Targeting health services in the poorest areas of the country. Building a national health service, I mean, that doesn't help nutrition that much, but it helps the 33% that are related to infection and that can be managed with a biomedical approach. But the whole point is it's much more than that. And the other country that I'd like to single out is Peru. Mm -hmm. Peru has made remarkable progress. Uh, since 2007, the prevalence of stunting in Peru dropped from 30 to, to about 13%. And, and they, do you know what they did? They put stunting as a key indicator for social policies. They say, stunting, you know, if I, uh, I have this joke, I, I tell my students, you probably know that. If I, if I went to a desert island and I could only take one indicator, it would be stunting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what I would do with in stunting in a desert <laughs> island. But it is, it is because it summarizes, uh, it summarizes the quality of life, it summarizes health care, it summarizes control of infection, mm -hmm. you know, summarize the quality, you know, it's, it's just such a fantastic indicator. And Peru did that by putting stunting as the key indicator of their anti-poverty agenda, not of their health agenda. Mm -hmm. Their anti-poverty agenda was centered on st reducing stunting, and they managed to do that. And they reduced disparities to a huge amount from the Andean uh, indigenous populations to the coastal populations who are better off. So. Yeah, and I think we have a lot to do with stunting, but let's not expect magic bullets for stunting. That's not going to work. Other questions? Yes, Megan.
Good question. I think the number one issue is to is to to show to show the importance of breastfeeding in any kind of society, rich or poor. For many, for a long time, breastfeeding was seen as okay. It's important to prevent diarrhea deaths in poor countries, among poor people, poor countries. Uh, we now have enough evidence to show that breastfeeding has long-term impact on intelligence, for example. And in, in the Lancet breastfeeding series we, we did last year, we showed uh, how much, m it, it's actually something astronomical, $300 trillion to the global economy if uh, everybody was breastfed and therefore everybody had three to four points higher IQ than they would otherwise have because of breastfeeding. Th that's a, a sort of a long jump, but it's a sort of argument that ministries of planning like to hear, and politicians will hear, say, oh, we could make money by promoting breastfeeding, make it a richer country. But that's not the only argument. You know, there's a lot of, uh, it's very important for mothers. We know very clearly now that longer breastfeeding duration prevents breast cancer, mm -hmm. and there's no question about that. A hundred good studies on that. It prevents uh, ovarian cancer as well. It reduces the risk of diabetes in women. So there's a whole, uh, the evidence is there. I think it, it's not an easy battle because it's not like giving a vaccine or antibiotic in which you have no industry against it. You don't have interests that are affected. It's very similar to the battle we're facing now in countries like Brazil uh, uh, regarding the commercialization of junk food, you know, the, the promotion of junk food. Uh, Coke, uh, McDonald's giving toys to kids. Uh, Mexico is leading the way now by taxing uh, uh, soft drinks, and Brazil is not. The, the, the lobby in Congress is too strong. So if I would say if what kind of research we need, I think it's more like the kind of research that you, that you do, and in terms of under, understanding the policy drivers and how to to achieve that. It's not that we don't need uh, research on basic uh, science. We, yes, we do. And I, I was just reading last week a wonderful piece. You know, breast milk has a lot of o oligosaccharides. You know, have you read that? It's, it's fantastic. It's some, uh, but the, the infant gut cannot absorb that. You know, wh why does breast, feed have, breast milk have that if the, if the gut can't absorb it? It's to feed the bacteria and to get the right microbiome. So every week we're getting new information on the biology mm -hmm. of breastfeeding that is such incredible, you know, live substance with stem cells, with microRNA, with oligosaccharides, and all these things we don't even know what they're there for, but they must be there for some sound evolutionary reason that will never be replicated by formula. I'm passionate about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're the right man for the job. Uh, one more question, and then we will uh, wrap up. Yes, you speak up when you. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead.
any comments from Cesar or the panel? I just want to agree with you. Uh, in the countdown report we're launching in December this year, it's the first countdown report after the SDGs were implemented. We have a special section on conflict countries because mortality of women and children is becoming now in heavily concentrated in countries that are in conflict situations because you just can't reach population in northern Nigeria or in, in Mali or in Libya because you just the services aren't there and there's policy that wouldn't make sense in these countries. And they are, folk, they are now more and more concentrating the deaths of women and children. Any other thoughts, Ben Emmanuel or Tego or? Yeah, uh, um, I was going to say that it, it's probably, the work is not visible, but there are groups working extensively within the countdown and outside on, on the, this specific issue of co conflict areas. Uh, specifically on the, because of, of the fact that programming and policy decision making cannot be based on the models that we currently use for countries that are not in conflict. So there's many differences and that's I think all coming into um, the forefront now given the current world situation and, and there is an, and you're going to start seeing a lot of work in, in this area trying to understand how do programs work when the populations are displaced for example. Um, I, I think that's coming forward but, but it's a, a, an important point like we perhaps should have started earlier, um, but, but the work is being done and I think we're going to start seeing some progress in that. Okay. Anna Manuel? And just to flip this on its, on its head a little bit, uh, I think it's absolutely essential that folks in global health recognize war and militarism as the key, uh, or a key, or if not the key, determinant of health inequities across the world. And if you look at particular settings such as the Democratic Republic of Congo if across the two Congo wars over the last decades, uh, with almost six million deaths, the highest uh, death rate uh, from a and crude uh, deaths uh, from a war since the Second World War, mostly related actually to nutrition or malnutrition, uh, just because of the overall uh, inability of people to get uh, at all ages, nutritious food, but particularly affecting uh, infants. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. And Andita, any uh, um, other thoughts before I invite Dr. Dirks up? No, I don't think I can add to that. I think excellent points were made. I think from a new researcher mm -hmm. perspective, it's often starting out in the field of global health when it's so diverse, it's often can be challenging to find your, or to understand how to leverage your discipline-specific expertise that you do develop during the course of your doctoral training, your postdoctoral training, into addressing these very broad social challenges that um, persist. So I think from a newer researcher perspective, it's really looking to your mentors to, who will guide you in, to navigate that path and connect you with the right people and, and, and ultimately influence and work on projects that uh, address these social challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well I think there's been a lot of food for thought and certainly um, I think as scientists and policymakers, we also have to be critical of some of our own failures and some of the, the methods that we've employed in research that we've also ignored um, and that we aren't doing to better uh, improve health and health equity. So I wanna thank the panel and Dr. Vittora for a most engaging discussion. I know we could be here all afternoon, um, but just to close the session, I, I I'm pleased to invite Dr. John Jerks, whom I introduced earlier, who is the President Emeritus of the Gardner Foundation, to say a few words of closure. Thank you. I want to congratulate Dr. Victoria on this occasion and all of you for having such a terrific day this morning at the Sick Children's Hospital and here this afternoon at the Faculty Club. It was very right to use the platform of John Evans' lecture on this occasion. It's hard to think of anybody in the last 50, 60 years in this Toronto area or in Canada as a whole who's made a greater impact on health in various ways and also on society. Many still think his greatest contribution was the development of the McMaster Medical School, 
where they took medical education out of this traditional straitjacket we were all in and opened it up to problem-based learning, a technique of education that has asked questions and looked for solutions that has been copied all over the world. But he did other things, many other things, including looking at the at basic science, needing the need in this country for asking basic questions, and that comes up in global health as well, as we've heard repeatedly. And also looking at the needs that were there, such as a terrific infrastructure program that developed in Canada as a result of his political initiatives. And then making the continuum f from basic science to industrial applications smoother instead of everybody living in their own isolated group of researchers. So that's smoother. We're still learning that trade. But then there is, of course, this global health impact. And that began early. So very early after his presidency at the U of T, he started to work with Rockefeller Foundation, World Bank. He visited many countries. He wrote a research book for development countries, and on and on. And uh, he was always a background supporter. So when Gardner Foundation suggested that in addition to the awards for basic science discoveries, we would like to give an award for science that was relevant and was impactful in the developing world, he was very encouraging. I think he maybe was surprised that it was Prime Minister Harper who gave us the money to do that and was very much in for both maternal and infant uh, reducing mortality and morbidity. But nevertheless, he was very positive and totally behind it. And so it's a great occasion to bring these two aspects together. So we're in the ninth year of this award. So the first eight years, with all carefully selected by an international group, three people were in HIV, one in HPV, two were in malaria, one with also had child health associated, and one was for anti-parasitic drugs. Bob Black was a little different. He was for malnutrition and micronutrient deficiency. And now we have you. And, uh, and I was very pleased when Janet Rawson called me earlier in the year and said, the winner this year is Cesar Victoria. And I was very great, because I always take examples from sports. So you'd been on a three and two count a number of years, but this year it was a clean home run, and here you are making great <laughs> impact. There's something that I've learned in my own travels in global health that people like Dr. Victoria reflect. First of all, they're always prepared to challenge the current traditional wisdom. Maybe it isn't right. Maybe it should be re-examined. They're, second, they're, they're extremely passionate about their work, relentless, never giving up. They're very collaborative. They develop good teams all over the world. They're good raising money. They like to talk. They like to travel. So when Dr. Victoria, and imagine this, says I have to go to the airport uh, 30, 40 miles, 40 times a year, he's not bothered by that because he's got a greater mission in mind. Now despite all the pressures, they never give up and they always have a sense of humor and they're fun to be with. So that's been my experience. Sometimes they even have a raunchy sense of humor as I found out once or twice. <laughs> so this is a great occasion and they never quit. And he tells me, we're here in the World Series. He's like a veteran who comes off the bench, still ready to make that timely hit and make the difference in a game or in a society or in a research project. Congratulations. Thank you. So thanks to all of you, thanks to our panelists, thank you to our special guest, Obrigada. And um, I want to just thank two people in particular, Nicole Bodnar and Vadim Levin for all their work in helping to plan this, and to our colleagues at SickKids and our partners at Gardner again for co-hosting a, a very special afternoon. Thank you.